Thank you uh, for the introduction. This is a joint work where, with Julia Hesse, Basman Putzeling, and uh, Patrick Toba. Um, and here we are considering the standard single sign-on approach, like with OAuth and OpenID uh, Connect, and try to enhance the security with cryptography. So if we recall the standard single sign-on approach, we have a user, we have some service providers, and we have an IDP. Basically, at some point, the user enrolls with the IDP, sets up an account, might have some attributes uh, shared there regarding who they are, where they live, and so on. Um, and uh, then, at later points, um, the user will want to authenticate or make accounts, sign in to different service providers such as Netflix or Alliance. So they uh, recover their, uh, so, so they sign in to the IDP, request them to construct a uh, token on their behalf, which can then be passed on to, uh, to a service provider, either directly or through the user. Um, these tokens are, of course, different from, uh, from, uh, from each service provider, and each time the user authenticates, they're basically uh, bearer tokens, signed JSON or XML. Um, this approach has a bunch of uh, advantages, hence this is uh, very widely used today, such as with uh, signing in with Facebook or uh, signing in with Google and so on, uh, because it allows minimal disclosure from the IDP towards the service providers. You only need to include in the token what the service provider actually needs to know. It's uh, very efficient since it just uses standard, uh, standard signatures and JSON. Uh, it's reliable since the service provider, so the IDP could be replicated uh, behind a content management network and so on. However, it also has uh, quite some disadvantages. It's uh, not private since now the IDP knows all the information about the user, including which places uh, the user wants to sign in, when the user signs into these, uh, these places, and so on. Uh, the tokens, it's, tokens themselves are usually linked to a specific ID of the user, hence even the service providers alone can identify the same user. And finally, and probably most importantly, uh, these IDPs are centralized trusted entities uh, that, uh, that, that can either, that if they're corrupt, can impersonate the user. If they're attacked, like the data can be uh, leaked and the attacker can impersonate the user and so on. So researchers have looked at how can we enhance the security of, the, of these approaches while the service providers still are agnostic to the fact that we are implying advanced cryptography. So there's a couple of works looking at this, uh, such as uh, the PASTA work by Akka Valadal and the PESTA work by, uh, by Baumedal, where they basically look into distributing the um, IDP into a virtual IDP consisting of a bunch of partial parties. So you can imagine Facebook, Apple, or Google are, uh, are basically uh, each running part of this virtual IDP. This, uh, this setting has advantages in that neither of them need to store anything that's directly derived from the password, and they will all need to agree in order to, to sign a token, so impersonation is also much harder uh, to do. Uh, basically, these protocols consist of two phases. First, a distributed password authentication, and secondly, a distributed token generation uh, using distributed or threshold signatures. So again, we have the same advantages as uh, before, uh, along with the fact that we now have, uh, have decentralized uh, the trust model. Unfortunately, we still have some issues uh, in relation to the tokens don't change, and they can still be linkable. Um, it's also not private. In fact, it's even worse now, since now we have three different uh, parties having all the information about, uh, about the user, in particular, uh, the attributes. So consider also the setting where these service providers want to know a bit more than uh, just, uh, just the attributes of perhaps the fact that the user is above 18. Uh, it could be, say, with Alliance that um, the user want to, uh, to get a loan approved, so they need to prove they have a certain amount of monthly income in their bank account, or they want an insurance, so they need a certified zip code to for the insurance company to calculate the risk of, uh, of theft and so on. Uh, so, if we look at that situation, well, basically, we have the same, except now the virtual IDP needs to have a bunch of uh, certified attributes from uh, different authorities, uh, which they need to store in order to, uh, to, to make these, uh, these tokens. So now they just become, in this situation with the distribution, they become data silos of very sensitive and personal information, which is clearly uh, undesirable. So in this work, uh, we're taking departure in the existing approaches of uh, pasta and pesto, and uh, we're looking into improving the security in relation to, in particular, in relation to these attributes. 
uh, we also come with several other contributions. So our point of approach is, first of all, we actually abstract away the password authentication part um, because it can be either replaced by a threshold password-based key management system or which is getting common these days, uh, secure hardware such as with passkey and, uh, and so on. The second step is we remove all the attributes from each of, of the virtual parties and replace them with the uh, secret shared versions that are validated using secure multi-party computation. Finally, we add a threshold model uh, to this, which is a bit different than the usual threshold model uh, you see in uh, distributed cryptography, in that we want to add this threshold for reliability and not for security, meaning that we want the protocols to be able to work if not all parties are, are online without actually having to kick them out and punish them afterwards. A lot of threshold protocols works with uh, if some parties are not online, you need to basically recover their secret shares and so on and then they're basically out. So we are trying to, to, to make a model that's different from this to do reliability. Finally, we have uh, proactive security, which means that all the secret material on the servers can be refreshed by an interactive protocol only between the servers and not the users. So this gives us, uh, gives us uh, the situation that if one server is hacked, we can basically run a lightweight refresh protocol and everything will be secure again. Whatever got hacked will be useless. Um, so basically what we achieve is a uh, single sign-on without a centralized uh, IDP, uh, which works with, uh, with private attributes and uh, selective disclosure of information based on these attributes. Uh, on a side note, we get from this protocol offline verification. It's used a lightweight, uh, could be implemented in the browser. Uh, we have lightweight revocation, threshold security. For those who are interested in more formal security, we also prove it UC uh, secure. The downside is we have a small amount of uh, computation uh, using secure multi-party computation, but this is only carried out on the server side. Uh, finally, we have had in mind of keeping compliance so that uh, authorities and service providers don't need to run any new code in order to implement this approach because you know, that's a very critical element in actually getting things, uh, things deployed. You can't make the whole world change uh, because you have a good idea, unfortunately. Or maybe you can, but it's very hard. <laughs> um, yeah. So just want to give the main idea of our, our, our approach. Uh, basically, we take the certificate that comes from a, a certification authority and we run a lightweight conversion protocol turning this into, uh, into something which is, can efficiently be verified, where policies can be verified on it efficiently later on. This is contrary to a trivial approach, which would be to get the certificates every time the user wants to use the IDP, or to do, uh, have the user do zero knowledge proofs on general signed, uh, signed documents every time uh, the user wants to, uh, to use, uh, use the IDP. So just to give a bit more intuition about how this scheme goes along, uh, it starts with a registration phase where the user wants to register at the service provider with some attributes, uh, with the IDP, with some attributes it gets from an authority. Uh, for this, uh, we use what is known as outsourced uh, MPC, which is an MPC protocol where the client, where you have a party with private input that's independent of uh, the parties actually computing the protocol. What this means is the computation and the complexity of the client is very lightweight. Uh, in relation to validating the certificates, we abstract this away and say you can do this with bulletproofs or you can use Deco or some other uh, primitive that exists exactly for doing these kind of, uh, these kind of things. Uh, then the overall idea is to use information theoretic max uh, on the attributes where the server is computing information theoretic uh, max which the user learns and where the servers verifiably secret share uh, the shares of this attribute. Then they can store this in, uh, in a database, and later on, when we wish to generate a token, the user inputs again the attributes and the MAC, and the servers recover, or a threshold, only two of these servers are needed at this point to recover this in MPC, validate this in MPC, and then along this, we can validate any policy on this attribute, uh, say range, say set membership, or equality, something like this. And if the servers agree, then they sign a token. Uh, we implemented this uh, using based on speeds for the MPC part in, uh, in a framework called, uh, called Fresco, uh, which is a Java framework, open source, uh, with high code coverage and an extensive API that's often used in research. Unfortunately, since it's Java, like the downside is it's not the fastest 
thing around to ever have seen the day, have seen light of day. But it also gives a bit more of an upper bound on like how we can imagine this, uh, the efficiency of this in a deployment situation. We work with attributes that are based on either 32 or 64-bit numbers, and we ran a bunch of different tests uh, using, uh, using AW, uh, AWS. Uh, there's a bunch of more numbers in the paper, but I think the main takeaway we want is the latency in the view of the client in order to, uh, to do, these, uh, do these things. And here we try to val uh, val evaluate different, uh, different policies uh, where we're looking at basically uh, equality, equality of advanced objects, range, which is, uh, say, for example, very usable in age. Uh, you want to prove someone is above 18 or below 65 or something like this. Uh, then we do set membership. So we had an experiment here where we were trying to say, okay, I'm a member of a specific country uh, in the world, and finally of a list of 1,000. So from these numbers, we see that, the, that these numbers are in milliseconds. So the first ones here are within the one second bound, which is uh, conceptually generally the situation you imagine that a user can have without getting interrupted by the latency of the flow. So, and we see like for the larger set membership, we still have some work to do in order to get the latency, uh, latency down uh, to something, uh, something within, this, uh, within this range. Yeah, um, that's, basic, uh, that's basically it. So um, yeah, to conclude, uh, we do, a, uh, we, do a, a, we use cryptography on standard uh, SSO in order to enhance uh, security, in particular with focus on allowing the use of attributes as well uh, without leaking any uh, private information to the servers or the service providers while keeping the authorities and the service providers agnostic to the fact that the user and the IDP are running an advanced cryptographic protocol. Yes, thank you. All right, we have time for a question or two while the next speaker gets set up. Uh, it depends on like the setup, like uh, it, uh, on, on what setup you do. You need all the servers to participate in uh, the registration phase, uh, where if someone cheats, it will uh, it will abort the protocol. Um, in general, you because we're based on secret sharing, you would always be able to uh, to recover the secret if more than half of the of the servers collude. So that's sort of the natural bound in, in relation to this. Yeah. The, the servers need to interact with each other during, uh, during the, the online phase because they're running an, uh, an MPC execution. So they do need to, to interact. Mm -hmm. All right, if there are no other questions, then uh, we can thank Tora again.